curriculum and beyond. Awesome. This webinar will explore the role of the Registered Professional Planner, the RPP, in enabling and supporting food to school B, farm to school BC initiatives uh, and vice versa. So these webinar, the webinar participants are encouraged to bring their interest and passion for food literacy, place-based education, food security, case studies to share, and their questions as to how they may champion, you may champion school, uh, school food initiatives and by extension, the communities we have the privilege to serve. I'm gonna hand it over to, uh, oh, before I do, Rowan, the witty case. She's the North Central Region Community Animator uh, with Farm to School BC, and which is a program of the Public Health Association of BC. So Rowan lives and grows in the traditional territory of the Lately Tanay First Nation. Uh, heart in hand, I give thanks that we're all here meeting on the Lately Tanay First Nation uh, traditional territory. She's the community animator for the North Central Hub of the Food to School BC, Farm to School BC. I do it every time, sorry, Ro Ro Roanne. Supporting school districts 28, 57, and 91. Rowan also works for REAPS. Yay, REAPS! For the Recycling and Environmental Action Planning Society and is co-owner of the Three Seeds Market Garden Farm, where al along with two partner growers, grows fresh fruit and vegetables for local markets. So that's our Rowan. And then we have Marcus Lobb, the Provincial Manager, Farm to School BC. So Marcus has over 12 years of experience working in school garden programs and establishing farm to school projects in elementary, middle schools, and in university settings. He is passionate about sharing his gardening blunders so you don't have to. I love that, Hale, sharing your fails so that the rest of us <laughs> have success. Awesome, thank you, Marcus. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to the team um, and uh, Rowan and Marcus have a very specific way they would like to do this and most of it is to engage with you. Looking forward to it, T over to you folks. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm just gonna share my screen now and then we can get started here. All right, everyone's seeing the slides? Great. Perfect. All right, Thanks. so I'll let Marcus uh, start this off here. Sure, thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Christine, for that uh, uh, warm welcome and hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be with you today um, for this presentation. Um, farm to School BC, so embedding food literacy education and building school community capacity. Um, we work in a lot of ways, and we'll just dis we'll discuss that within the context of this presentation. Um, but when we were asked to come and bring forward a presentation to you all, we tried to think of how planners might uh, be engaged in this work, or or might support the kind of um, challenges, I guess, or obstacles that uh, we observe in our work um, from uh, from the perspective of engaging with schools in, in a community kind of setting. So we're going to tailor it to that and we're going to um, touch upon high level examples and we're certainly very interested in, in um, your own perspectives. And so we're going to leave some room at the end to talk a little bit about that and get uh, get some feedback about what you what you see and what uh, um, uh, you think uh, ways in which planners could be engaged in this work. So next slide, please. So we take this moment to express sincere gratitude for the opportunity to gather on these traditional lands uh, today and acknowledge that as settlers of this land, uh, many of our practices and ways of knowing, knowing um, uh, have been and are uh, inherently colonial. We recognize that uh, acknowledging the land we meet on is not enough to heal injustice, uh, but merely a starting place to better understand, listen, strengthen, and empower Indigenous ways of uh, uh, knowing and being. We respectfully request everyone to take a moment to reflect and or share in the chat whose land you are joining us from today, as well as any other offerings and expressions of gratitude you would like to share. So often when we do uh, our webinars and our workshops uh, virtually like this, people take a chance in the chat to just uh, mention you know, what lands that they reside on and work on or, or, or any further extension of a territorial acknowledgement that they would like to offer. Next slide, please. So for me, I am joining you from uh, the traditional ancestral and ceded homeland and 
territory of the Lekwungen peoples. And so in modern day, those are the, the following nations, the Songhees, the Squimalt, and uh, Saanich, uh, Wissanic uh, peoples. Um, so I personally am uh, just uh, located just outside of what is colonially known as Victoria uh, presenting today. And I will pass it over to Roanne. Thank you, Marcus. And I am joining here from the beautiful traditional territory of the Kalitine peoples. Um, and I'm very grateful to be here on this land today and, and sharing this space with you. I also entered into the chat there some links um, for if for nativeland.ca, which you, where you can explore um, where you are and learn from there, and also a link to the Kalaitane uh, website also to familiarize yourself and learn more about the amazing peoples of this land. And I also wanted to share this is I'm also with a local food collective and we have a culture advisor, Kim Gucci, who um, helped make this beautiful um, acknowledgement here as well. So as settlers on this land, we wish to acknowledge the 9,000 plus years of the Claytonay Na Nation's stewardship. Their ancestors have cared for this beautiful land that feed us all, and we wish to continue to welcome their teachings and ancestral knowledge as we work towards food security for all people. So Christine uh, gave the introduction to us all already, so we could probably uh, skip over the slide, but hello again. So a little bit about Farm to School BC. Um, we are a program that brings healthy, local, and sustainable foods into schools across British Columbia and provides students with hands-on learning opportunities that develop food literacy, all while strengthening local food systems and enhancing school and community connectedness. So Farm to School BC empowers students and school communities to make informed food choices while contributing to vibrant, sustainable regional food systems that support the health of people, community, and environment. And so there's just kind of the pillars there in that graphic. Our, our vision is really healthy, local, and sustainable food on the plates and minds of all students in British Columbia. A little nod to our administrators and funders. Uh, we are a program of the Public Health Association of BC, and we are supported by the province of British Columbia. Uh oh, <laughs> there you go. It's on the team one. Or on the program, that's right. No problem. Uh, just a few things about so, uh, some of the ways that we engage with schools and programs. And really, these, these kind of noted programs that you see here are, are the product of the interest that we're seeing from schools. Right? We're not really creating uh, um, necessarily programs and bringing them towards schools. Schools are telling us. We want to do beekeeping. We want cooking classes. We want farm visits. And the way that we support that is by providing funding to allow them to do it, but also providing them support in terms of our staff and, and the way that we animate the work. So helping them connect to beekeepers, helping them find farms that are educational, helping them learn about uh, how to grow microgreens or, or uh, uh, build gardens at their school. So that's a lot of the work that we do. Next slide. So we've been around, I believe it might be 17 years at this point, but uh, um, we've uh, funded, I think it's about 333, 34 programs now. That's an annual granting stream that we do that goes out to schools. Um, there's grants for one, uh, between one and $3,000 that we give out. Those go out every fall. So we've completed that cycle for this year. Um, very popular, usually somewhere between 70 and 100 applications that come in each year, K to 12 is the focus. And with our animators, which we'll speak to in about a moment, uh, we are currently directly supporting 22 school districts across the province. But of course, we, we look to support all school districts and all schools, uh, independent First Nations and other uh, through our, our resources and um, some of the, uh, the networking uh, uh, capacities that we have. Next slide. Yeah, just a little bit more about us. Uh, we are a, both a framework, a network, and a program. And so... That's really what it comes down to. And Rowan, who is an animator up in the region that you live in, that's the focus that she's really doing, the promotion of food literacy and helping connect people and provide that support, networking teachers with community to, to bring together uh, these knowledge bases and experiences and uh, to uh, and the development of the program kind of at a higher level that's always happening. 
little bit about our team, uh, mostly the kind of uh, eight people that you see there to the right. Those are our animators who live all across the province. They're really the backbone of our work. They're the ones that are engaging with community. They're the ones that are listening and providing support when they see it needed. Um, very uh, skilled staff. Um, and then on the left there is just uh, some of kind of our uh, internal like program level uh, team. And one of the cool aspects of it is we have a food literacy coordinator. And so this individual helps create resources and support the animators when engaging with teachers. Uh, we work very closely with regional health leads or uh, our partners within the, the five major health regions. And so our animators work closely with them to, uh, to support schools. Um, they help in the review process of the grants. They provide um, you know, best, uh, best practices for talking about nutrition and, and uh, food and health and, and whatnot. And so uh, very valuable. They've been some of the, the individuals that you see here have been with us since the very beginning. Thank you, Marcus. And I apologize if my dog barks. Um, the male lady was just literally at my door. So hopefully he uh, settles down. But um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to speak a little bit more to how our regional hub model works and how community animators such as myself um, connect with the community. So as you can see here, we're uh, spread across uh, parts of the province here. So we have eight of the hubs um, existing across and my, me, myself, I'm here in the uh, North Central uh, Regional Hub. And uh, community animators working with the hub. So each regional hub has a community animator, um, such as myself, and we're in the communities. So um, each hub might have different school, multiple school districts. So the North Central Hub, I have school district 28, 57, and 91. So it kind of goes across quite a, a space. And there's a Northwest uh, animator as well, which kind of connects the West and goes over. Um, so we, we were closely up here in North Central. Um, and yeah, so how we support uh, the beauty of that is it, it definitely it varies. Um, it, we like Marcus was speaking to, we kind of connect with the community and see what the educators, um, the district, the schools, what, what they want and how they want the support. And we, we follow the energy and we support as best we can with that. So how we do that may include connecting schools to community is a really big piece um, to existing, like other organizations that might be able to support or resources. Um, we support teachers with one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, we also have our own Farm School BC grants. So schools that are awarded those grants, uh, we support them with their projects. That could be all the way from their project teams to, um, yeah, help helping with um, uh, connecting resources or answering questions or even going there and helping uh, like move soil and get seeds in the ground or pursue with activities there. Um, and also uh, relaying what supports they may want and we might develop those in house or if we know where they are um, supporting that way. Also connecting with the school district level. So um, connecting maybe between what educators want to the school district or supporting uh, like school garden policies, which Marcus will speak to a bit more later. Uh, and then also, um, Connecting educators with hubs uh, within the hub and provincially. So we do Pro-D day events. We do um, learning circles, which might not be on Pro-Ds, but they're in addition to that, um, such as we have an Indigenous Foodways learning circle later today, actually um, connecting educators to Indigenous knowledge keepers. And those we also do um, by what, what we hear uh, educators really want areas of support in. So those definitely vary a lot as well. So the um, North Central Hub, which is mine that I support, uh, we there's currently 17 funded schools here, uh, and Dragon Lake Elementary in Cornell actually is where kind of the the seed of this entire program started, which is really exciting. It was from um, really really committed and energy people with Northern Health um, was kind of a part of that and some other people, and they started like the salad bar program there, and then it it blossomed and evolved to where it's at. Um, so within my, the hub set, the three school districts within my hub, um, activities that are going on, like every school district has school gardens that are existing, which is really exciting. Uh, school gardens that might need some revival, which is happening. Uh, there's um, 
and then each the hubs were funded with some new schools like Nuco Lake here in Hickson Elementary. They're going to both have gardens and some indoor growing, which is really exciting. But also that um, school to community connection piece, because like uh, we listed before, a lot of educators are really keen for um, connecting out to community gardens or field trips to farms. But here in, um, in Prince George, for example, the college has a greenhouse and UMBC has a botanical garden and they also have um, some food gardens. So uh, connecting field trips to go to there uh, was quite successful. Um, so yeah, opportunities there. And in other communities, I'll speak to a little bit more later about that. But for example, of like community connectedness, um, this can be where it can be really creative as well. Um, like we did fund a school in School District 91 and they're getting beehives and uh, like honey harvesting um, kits. So they're connecting with like the, the knowledge keepers that um, with, with the hives and uh, keep bees. So. Yeah, it can really just vary with what the wants are, but these are just examples of here in Prince George. There's the organization REAPS, um, which I actually also work for, but it, it, that's just a good example of that already connect into schools. They already support the kind of the green initiatives, so working alongside with what they're doing. And these are images of what I was speaking to there up at UMBC. Um, the David Douglas Botanical Garden Society and Master Gardeners are great um, connections for, they took students through tours through the gardens and um, yeah, so making those connections for um, ex experiences that can extend outside the school as well or come to the school are, are very valuable. So I think now it's back to you, Marcus. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, so the next few slides are going to go really into um, a lot of the ways in which um, schools are uh, are participating in usages of land. Um, so there's there's many different ways uh, that that ha that is that is happening, and we have seen different styles of partnerships. Uh, one kind of defining thing that we've learned is that there is no real finite policy around how these sort of engagements with the land take place. These so-called greening projects or or sustainability projects, and so. Uh, we're going to go over a few just to kind of highlight what what how we support or what we're seeing being in the community uh, with the with the following slides. So, next slide, please. Oh no, you're good there. Okay, so yeah, so um, school gardens. Um, this is one of the biggest ones, obviously. Uh, probably we, I think we funded thirty three schools this year, and I think twenty five or twenty seven of them were directly uh, looking to fund the creation um, or this sort of a, um, expansion of a school garden. School gardens really can look different depending on uh, the goals, um, the capacity, the climate uh, of, the, of the staff that are working with them. Those who are actually supporting school gardens can look really different. It can sometimes be really a so-called school food champion. So a teacher who just has a very a strong passion and is and is uh, committed to finding a way to engage their uh, classroom into a garden or figuring out a way to make it more easy for other teachers to access. Um, it could be <clears throat> members of the community that really wanna see this happen. What it comes down to is there's really a, a strong desire from individuals within a community to showcase how school gardens can be very valuable educational, um, uh, educational opportunities. And, some see that as really about um, food and, and the taking in of food. Some of see it as about skills and of learning to grow. Some see it just about uh, being outdoors, you know, and then in some cases, depending on the style of garden, it can be about specific plants that are being grown and how they can connect to ecosystems, to culture, et cetera. Um, so just in these pictures, this is kind of a, a somewhat uh, common style that you might see. Uh, it's kind of more or less a no dig kind of method where uh, planter boxes made of wood come in, uh, they're elevated directly right off of the lawn and soil is brought in and filled in. Um, but uh, it, you know, lots of these gardens will also have, it's hard to see in the left picture there, but kind of around the perimeter to the right are, is actually some very small fruit trees and fruit bushes that were planted there that were gonna kind of be in a semi-circle around this garden to create a little bit of a feeling of like, uh, like being kind of nooked in and like feeling kind of like a, um, a little bit private. But this was the, the very first year that this garden was built. And you might notice there's no fence around this garden, which is very rare in this province. 
this garden I built um, in Montreal uh, over 10 years ago, uh, right in the middle of the city. It's right in front of the school. So there was not uh, an issue of deer there. Uh, squirrels are kind of the main issue there. So, so yeah, so that's kind of one thing that we're seeing is school gardens and some of the challenges that come up and, and pose um, barriers to this or pose, uh, I guess, uh, sometimes headaches to uh, schools is in and around whether or not you can dig whether or not there's issues of safety to be digging, uh, hitting wires, different things like that. One of the major issues that always comes into play is, are these gardens close to accesses of water? What does it look like to bring water to these areas, et cetera? Um, then the question of fencing comes into play and uh, some of the infrastructural things about adding of buildings and whether or not they're obstructing views or too close to sidewalks, um, whether or not they become... Uh, prone to vandalism and different things like that. And, and obviously, we're always thinking about things like exposure. Is there going to be enough light here you know, for this garden to exist? Is it going to be too windy? Um, lots of gardens are recommended to be in a spot that has a very high visibility of the public that lives in and around the school garden due to the fact that that actually makes a more engaged community, which can deter one of the uh, major barriers to successful gardens, which is vandalism and theft. It's very common. And a lot of times it's common. Um, it can be uh, a product of people not even knowing that what this garden really is about. And so they see the things in there and they think, oh, maybe it's a community garden where I could come graze a little bit. So, so that's a little bit about the school gardens. I could go into a lot of detail about it, but let's just start with that. And then we'll, we'll look into a couple other examples. So here is a couple different examples. Um, as well. And these ones have a lot more of digging and ground. They're, they're focusing on perennials. Uh, in the case of the one on the lower right, it's, it's focusing on native plants, indigenous plants, um, the idea of kind of like revitalize, revitalization um, of a natural space. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's just, just a couple different examples in here. The one in the top left is, is also one that was in a city, and it was a mixture of planter boxes, um, trees, and bushes that were in ground. This was in the early stages of the garden. Um, so uh, this garden was planted um, 13 years ago now, so I'd be like totally interested to see. This is the very first garden ever built there on the left, and uh, I had no idea what I was doing, and uh, it was a lot of work. But um, it would be very interesting for me to go back into Montreal and see what it looks like um, now. But so just a couple different examples of, of how these uh, spaces are being set up for. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll move along to the next one. So you might have noticed in the previous pictures that there was very little seating. And that is something that uh, more and more, I think, people who are engaging in the outdoor uh, gardens uh, as educational spaces are realizing we need spots for kids to sit. Uh, as you see right in the middle there underneath the um, umbrellas, they've created an outdoor classroom. So a place where the kids come out, they sit, the teacher or educator is able to speak to them about you know best practices in the garden and, and make some connections to their learning. Um, and so you're seeing a lot more of that, the opportunity to treat these spaces as just an outdoor classroom. And What's really nice is that also for these spaces to, to, to be outdoor classrooms that can even be separate from the garden in a way that you don't have to come outdoors to these gardens uh, um, just to engage with them, but you can just be in a natural, beautiful setting, just being outside, not being in the classroom. And there's um, considerable research out there about the benefits of outdoor education, the ways in which different students uh, respond to working uh, outdoors in, in more of an open environment uh, that allows their, uh, their them to, uh, to be more calm in their approach to learning. I've seen it firsthand in my work uh, well before I even knew that there was a, um, a lot of research in and around this. So uh, I think the potential for outdoor learning environments is actually um, huge and uh, I really hope to see more of those coming in the future. I think in terms of planning, that could be one of those um, really important pieces is how to, when doing new builds of schools, they can establish this outside because there is considerable investment to developing uh, a nicer outdoor classroom, especially if you want to have um, shade cloth and different things to, to, to protect them from the sun. Like these umbrellas are, are probably okay, but I don't know how well they would withstand lots of wind and different things like that. So this is something that we're seeing more and more interest in. Um, from schools and school districts. School farms have uh, emerged um, in recent years. Our organization has closely worked to develop some of these as well, which is really exciting. We're learning a lot and actually uh, 
um, sort of becoming in the final stages of developing a bit of a toolkit to help uh, guide uh, schools that are interested in, in, in doing this. Some of the ways that we've seen it uh, in recent are partnerships between schools and farmers, which is the case of this uh, picture here, which is in uh, Victoria. So um, this is actually a, a partnership between a local nonprofit that focuses on growing food in an urban setting. Uh, they have their own programming that's focused on kids. Um, they do they do adult programming as well and all, all kinds of stuff. But this program really brings secondary level students out into this um, garden that's a high productive garden that's mostly focused on lettuce greens, um, salad greens, things of that nature. They get credit for doing this in the summer months um, as an extension of like a skills program. These um, crops that are grown here are actually sold at a little bit of a micro stand that they set up in partnership with the farmer who sort of oversees the development of the program. And a lot of the um, the greens that they grow here also go into a salad bar program that they host uh, uh, bi-weekly inside the school during the, the regular school year. Um, you might notice that they're growing in these unusual looking sacks. Um, this is a pretty interesting model um, that uh, actually moves around a lot of the barriers that are involved in digging and things and, and some of the some of the um, um, some of the challenges of school districts not wanting to see land be entirely transformed. Um, so this is a little bit of a way to uh, answer that. These sacks can be brought in and established in like one day with volunteers and should for whatever reason um, they need to move this garden or let's say there's some sort of seismic upgrade happening to the building. This garden could just be up and moved right in relatively no time and moved to a different location, which is really great because um, uh, farmers are always investing in the soil and building the land for the benefit of the crops and, and uh, the health of the ecosystem. And to lose that entirely, which we have seen with some schools who have done changes of of the, the grounds and stuff is really, it's really heartbreaking for the farmers that work so much and invest so much into the soil, et cetera. So this is just an example of, of some of the emerging interest in actually utilizing space on school grounds uh, for growing uh, crops that go directly back into meal programs inside the schools, including cafeterias. Next slide. Yeah, so and this is yeah a second one that's up up in Squamish, also a partnership with a farmer up in that area, uh, based on a school and yeah, beautiful. This is this farm is only I believe in its second year right now, and uh, really is like the product of uh, tremendously strong relationships between the local farmer, and um, and the school. And so each relationship, like you're probably wondering, how could this possibly work? They're all different. You know, there's it depends on the relationship. In some instances. The goal is that the farmer does education. And so there can be a relationship where there's remuneration that is going towards the farmer to do that. Well, in other instances, it could be that the farmer is allowed to sell a certain portion of these crops throughout within their own business that they have going on. So I'm not going to get too much into details about that. But this is an interesting thing to consider is how farmers can, um, one of the major barriers for young farmers that are coming up right now is land purchasing land. It's very expensive, especially what we've seen over the past few years since COVID. And it makes it an extreme barrier for, for young farmers to uh, to to uh, start their careers and start their businesses. We're hearing a lot about how farmers are aging out. I think the average age is something like 55, 57 right now, and that they're wanting to get out of the business. But the problem is most of these farmers that bought land 30 to 40 years ago bought huge parcels that cost a lot of money. And current generation of 30 year olds that cannot afford these. So they're looking for alternatives to start their businesses to, and to stay also close to where the food is being um, consumed and purchased. That's one of the things we've also observed. Having a farm way out in Northern Alberta requires a lot of travel, et cetera. Having a farm right in a town, it's, it's really direct and, and then requires a lot less of uh, cost for a farmer to generate profit. So there's a lot of advantages to uh, having farms and farm land stay in and around the actual place where people are living. So um, school district policies uh, vary from district to district. Um, some can be uh, very restrictive to what a garden can look like, and they will tell you it has to be this shape, it has to be made of this materials. Um, some don't have any uh, policies, and there's positives and negatives to both of those. 
Um, but there's more and more interest of trying to develop a procedure and process between those who are interested at the school level, whether that's teachers, PAC, parents, uh, administration at the school level, and school districts to work together to find best practices for um, initiating and putting in uh, school gardens. And so I was fortunate to work alongside a couple of partners in the capital region, uh, with which was uh, with the Greater Victoria School District, and we developed one. And it was an extension of an existing greening uh, document that they had. So if someone wanted to put in a few pine trees or, or whatever it was on the property, they would go through this process. But it was very limited, and it didn't talk a lot about who was maintaining it, what the goals were for it. So we helped them develop this uh, policy, uh, which... Um, at the point of the time when it was to be launched it was right when COVID arrived and it has now been stalled and has yet to be uh, initiated or installed right into the um, to the website. But just to speak that school districts are very curious about uh, how to uh, engage these. And in my opinion, it's much better for them to uh, work towards these with planners when they are looking to build school dis uh, new schools, which in the region that I'm in, it's... it's um, growing very rapidly. And I've had uh, school districts reach out and ask questions like, where would you put a school garden? What would it look like? And, and I, you know, I'm not a planner, but I give my, my two cents. And, um, and uh, we, I can definitely say that if there was more interest and there was more engagement from the beginning stages of planning uh, a grounds and a school, that these gardens would uh, have a higher likelihood of success long term. And the main one being uh, really in and around irrigation and fencing. Uh, but also includes like where you put it, what materials you might put within a garden, um, a garden setting. I've seen lots of gardens be built 30 by 30 feet with a chain link fence and they dump a bunch of gravel in thinking that's the best way to, way to stop invasive species. And then you see um, teachers and students out there digging out two feet of gravel to try to plant a tree and, and it's a real thing. And so I often wonder, I wish we could have uh, better policies and better planning at that level. So um, yeah, just to speak to uh, how there's school district policies aren't clear across the province. They vary from district to district. Some are very uh, forward thinking and some uh, uh, are not so much. Yeah, so we wanted to talk a little bit more about school community connectedness and land use. So there's been some pretty cool things that we've seen over uh, the past few years. Uh, pass over to the next slide. So. This one is based in Nanaimo here on the island in which there was a parcel of land that had been uh, farming for uh, decades. Um, and um, basically the city expanded, suburbs built up around it, and this parcel of land was being threatened to be taken back and put into uh, to, uh, housing basically. Um, a local nonprofit in the community and others came together uh, and they advocated for the city to purchase this land to keep it as a uh, ag reserve land for education purposes. And it, and it went through and it happened. It's only a couple of years ago. Um, and it's called the five acre farm, it's really beautiful. It's really used, they, they, they grow quite a bit there and it goes to their local farmers markets, but it's really used as an educational demonstration site that allows people and, and especially a lot of students to go and access this land and learn about the possibilities. And so you can see that on the left there, it's kind of more traditional rows that looks like farming. But on the right there, it's a, it's like a hedgerow that goes along there that's all um, pollinator species that really brings in all of those pollinators. And so it's actually a, a wonderful spot when um, kids are out on the land. If you've ever spent much time in and around natural environments, kids often love to just like watch the bugs and, and look at the flowers and see all the life activity that's going on there. And so it's just showing a little bit of the, the kind of uh, multiple ways in which the space um, can be uh, used for learning. This is another interesting one that actually hap it happens to be really close by my house. Um, so a gardening society, the Paulwood Garden Society, approached um, the local city hall and noticed that they had this swath of about probably a half acre that just kind of was next to their parking lot that didn't have any trees on it, was just being cut by a lawnmower every two weeks. And they came and they proposed that they would establish um, a school, uh, not a school garden, but a community garden on this location. And so it got passed by council and they built it out. Um, and within uh, short order, the elementary school across the street said, hey, 
we uh, we could walk our students over there and engage with uh, the garden. And so the Colville Garden Society said, you want to know what? We will give you guys a couple of garden boxes and you can come and you can take care of it. Um, and in the past few years, I've actually seen that that garden expand to, to allow more opportunities for the students to come over. Um, I've long been interested personally in the possibilities in and around planners um, looking to develop community gardens uh, next to school gardens or next to schools rather. I saw this firsthand while living in Montreal. I built a school garden uh, at, a, at, a new, uh, at a school um, and they so happened to at the very back of it have a community garden that had been there for decades. And when we were trying to think about where to put our school garden, uh, we approached the community garden and said, hey, we would like to partner alongside of you and use access to your water, et cetera. And they were totally open to the idea. And so we ran a hose off of there. We would chat with them over the fence lots. And uh, we would even talk about the idea of them coming and offering little lessons in and around it. But it definitely got my mind thinking about when new schools are being built, how it, you could attach both a school garden and a community garden. And so there's that there's obviously more and more interest in people gardening that has really taken off since COVID with the uh, the increase in food uh, security that has been become very aware to many people, especially with the rise in inflation around food costs, is more and more people are looking to build those skills up of growing food. And so you're going to see uh, an increase in uh, community gardens coming out uh, uh, more and more in the coming years. The benefits of putting them together is that community gardens are often often a, a wealth of knowledge and their ability to uh, bounce ideas off of. And many of the people who are in community gardens are, are people with time on their hands, a lot of retired people who would love to uh, engage with a, community, uh, a school garden and students. And so, yeah, there's a lot of potential there. It's all the same infrastructure essentially, uh, but it's just neat to see this project take place where it was just across the street and now students can walk over and don't have to worry about always renting buses, which can be costly to engage in, in the, um, this kind of like for these kinds of learning opportunities. This is another neat one that's uh, based in Greater Vancouver. I'm trying to think of the specific community. It might be Coquitlam. Um, but this is Suwalk, uh, and they are a school that's, and they partner very closely with Fresh Roots, which is a leader in, in and around uh, food literacy, food education, work, farming, urban farming, et cetera. Um, I got to visit the school about five years ago. Really cool, the different kinds of uh, things that they were doing. But I wanted to specifically speak about this neat opportunity that uh, was there. And that was, this school was built next to a parcel of um, uh, forest, essentially. So an underdeveloped uh, piece of uh, land. And what was really neat about that, it was fenced. So it was something that kids could go into this forest. But what they did is they pivoted it to actually treat it a bit like a project in a number of ways. They started removing a lot of the invasive species and, and planting indigenous species back into this uh, forest. And uh, educational assistants used the forest pathways as a chance to walk with students to calm them down and, and uh, work on like mental health calming and uh, things of that nature by taking them out through the forest for for uh, just uh, peaceful walks through the forest. Also kind of interesting is a, a small stream uh, that was underground uh, throughout the, the city comes out right inside this forest that you're seeing here behind these students. And it's actually uh, is a, a salmon, a salmon, uh, uh, estuary or a salmon area that they come back and and do their spawning grounds. Uh, so that that's kind of neat. But um, so it just makes the case for it. in some of the schools I've been to just how wonderful it is is when building new schools they do allow kind of a forced section for students to be in uh, a major a major um, a major I think uh, issue moving forward is going to be the lack of trees in school grounds, uh, especially in urban environments. Uh, when I worked in, in Montreal, I supported 15 schools and school garden projects, and I saw basically zero trees on, in any of these schoolyards. And so with the, uh, the rising temperatures, the sun becoming harsher and harsher, and, and people becoming uh, more likely to get sunburns, etc., I think you're, we're going to need to really think about uh, providing shade. Um, and I think that these forests are a great way that students can play in there um, on those days where there's very little um, cloud cover, et cetera, and it's very hot. So that's just another consideration for planners. 
Thank you, Marcus. And then um, I was just giving as an example in North Central Hub here within um, Kaili Tene Land in Prince George is the Queensway Community Garden Space. It's actually a privately owned spot, the Gilead Farm. Some people might be aware of it. And this is an image of their community garden space. But there's an additional five acres existing that the owners are hoping that will be the community can come together. And this is, I'm hoping to be a success story similar to that five acre farm Marcus uh, spoke of because um, yeah, there's collective uh, community members that want to try to see how we can uh, keep it for agricultural land, but agricultural education for the community and this is a good example of a lot of educators I connect with within Prince George they they really um, speak to wanting to have a space where they could do a field trip where it can be set where they can connect with community growers where they can we can be an open space for projects for activity for workshops and mentorships and and presentations on the land and then an opportunity like this if we can um convert this land to that open educational space is is having a space for student participation and hands on in planting. But in addition to that, also having space for students to play, having that space carved out for them to be in with the plants, um, but also for that expression of play and excitement. Um, there was a great presenter I just saw, uh, educator Megan Zenny, and she's speaking to the the value of having those uh, exploration, having like dinosaurs in the part, garden that has lots of weeds to still make it like great, or like little fairy sections or um, bug hotels, if you've heard of that. But just having this community space for that education and exploration because a lot of a lot of educators and schools want school gardens but there's um you know barriers to having that happen in some places um that they, they don't really want it or there might be barriers for other reasons so having this um external space and also for the collaboration you're speaking of with community connection this is where like reaps and the david douglas society in prince george can also uh, support with the teachings and learnings on uh, a community uh, open educational space so and I'm also just going to give an example in North Central of um, a community this is in Vanderhoof it's a school WL McLeod and they have for over the last decade they've evolved their school food program and it's pretty amazing and it's a good example of school community connectedness because there were um, educators um, and also parents the pack was really involved but the, up here in the top picture this is a community members um, property and they just really wanted to support the evolution of this so they let them um, break ground and establish this within their own private garden as they explored where else um, it could it could evolve so currently now this is actually a school district um this is school district land that is both a school garden space but also a community garden space so they have a community garden society that uh, operates um i think more than half of the space but they work in harmony really well together to support um, students in using this space and they work together in terms of fundraising and gaining infrastructure and co-using spaces and uh, it's 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 a wonderful wonderful space so this is just some photos here and they have donations in the community that really support they have greenhouses now and this school program so this they produce quite a lot of food actually in addition to the learning and they bring it back to the school where they food process and they do all kinds of things and the community actually just supported with a donation for a walk-in cooler for this school but that's also going to support community growers that need the cooler space which is because it's right speaking again to what Marcus was saying the placement of a community garden close to the schools is it's just a, a footpath away from the school so yeah community and the schools working together for food security it's a it's a beautiful space if you can ever go and visit and this is just an image of the, school, the front of the school, but um, you can see in the left there in the back, there's like the tree line there. So this is in um, Barlow Creek in Kuenal. And it's a good example of the exploring the placement of a school because they have um, like a natural kind of forest area around the school. But what they've done is they have a uh, fenced off, like going into the forest and they're turning part of that forest into um, an outdoor classroom and they want to really invest more and more into that space so that's where even and designing a new 
new community or a new school is thinking like how, where are elements that will benefit if you put the school um, on a green belt and then you can incorporate that into the, into the school's uh, space for those teaching and outdoor classroom opportunities. So now we wanna give you uh, time to discuss amongst yourself and to get talking. Um, thanks for listening to us going through all of that. Um, so we're, I'm going to just uh, have everyone go into breakout rooms and it's just gonna auto assign uh, by how many people are on the call. And when you're in your breakout rooms, um, we just really want it uh, to prompt you to just get discussing about what we were just talking about. And then of course, with your planning knowledge, like to think like, how can planners support like land use and project planning for school, new school design or community design that can support um, incorporating food literacy for schools, uh, land use and project planning, school community connectedness. Um, so I don't think there's a slide here, but I remember hearing a community where their city hall, the front land on the city hall was converted to gardens that supported this like connecting to education piece. So the creativity that can be from developing new, but also claiming uh, open spaces in the community that are existing for this and supporting school districts and schools and integrating gardens and outdoor classrooms um, at, yeah, whether that's through policy or just help um, supporting through planning and making it more accessible with the knowledge that you have. So in these breakout rooms, I'm going to share in the chat right now there. Um, it's just a link to a Google Doc. So if when you're in the breakout rooms, if you have lots of great ideas and discussion, uh, feel free to take notes. Um, there's different um, sections for the four different breakout rooms um, that you'll be you'll go into where if people just want to jump in and take notes there, that would be lovely. So I'm just going to open the breakout rooms now. And uh, for the breakout rooms, yeah, we'll give you about um, We'll give you about, yeah, 10-ish 10, 10 minutes and then we'll bring you back. And after that, we're gonna go into discussion with everybody here and more opportunity to contribute. Okay, I'm gonna open them now. Thanks everyone. I better mute myself because I'll keep talking. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. I tried to type legibly, Rowan, um, my stream of thought as I was harvesting Ashley and Daniel's brains because, you know, two regional districts. So that's some good stuff right there. So it's in there for you. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate. Absolutely. Appreciate um, Is everyone back in yet? Waiting. I think everyone's back but one, so I'm just going to close that out. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, hope you enjoyed the discussion group. So now that we're all back, we can um, chat together and discuss what you spoke of in the groups. So I'm just going to share my screen again here. We can get back into it. So um, now that we're all back, I just want to give the opportunity for the groups to um, discuss what the takeaways were from your group discussion. So what were the key points the group discussed? Um, and then we can also talk about like, what have you learned today within your discussions around and what we presented and what might you take back with your work? So um, while we're uh, discussing, I'm also gonna link you in here. I'm gonna share first the Google doc link uh, that you were just in, just in case. And so, I'm also going to share the mentee link where you can go to contribute into as well, but I wanted to share also that um, the initial uh, Google group um, link there as well, because for people that don't want to go to mentee, because it does take you to a different uh, screen or you um, can't do that and you're more comfortable adding uh, this, this, these discussion points in the Google Doc, please feel free to do that as well. So 
I did just share in the chat there the Menti link, but you can also use the QR code on the screen here. And that's going to take you to um, our Menti platform where you can contribute to um, what the key points are that were discussed. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now, and then I'm going to bring up the Menti uh, part of where everyone can contribute in. So just bear with me here as it opens up. And so and while you're doing that, I'm going to suggest that Daniel from the Regional District of Fort George, Fraser Fort George, uh, share uh, just, you know, because you know how people hesitate to share. So I'm going to say, hey, Daniel, when it's time to share, share some of those gems that you were <laughs> sharing with me. Yeah, definitely. So to everyone that follows that mentee link that was shared into the chat, um, you should be able to now... Yeah, enter your chat and we'll see live here what people, what, what's on people's minds and what was learned and interests that were discussed in your group and key points. So we have your lack of planners at the school board level. And you're also welcome, if it's the easiest form for you, to enter your thoughts into the chat um, as well. And we can go back to um, discussing this as a group in the room as well. So the ones up on the screen so far, lack of planners at the school board level, um, RPPs not often connected with schools, more coordination between local governments, school districts, and food organizations, um, it looks like there's um, no additions yet into the Google document or the chat, but on here, there's more, um, not much conversation happening between school districts and planners. Regional and local governments take the lead, um, form the community. They are generally ready to support initiatives. There can be policy and zoning to allow for use, but uh, how to make it happen. So I'm going to let the mentee, you can still keep contributing into the mentee here. You can also can add to the chat or the Google document, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, to allow us as a group to uh, discuss on these topics as well. So I just gonna I can open it up to everybody uh, to to um, yeah discuss amongst ourselves on these key points. We've got a good uh, 18 minutes left, folks. So hop in here. As I was saying, uh, Daniel, how about some of those good ones that you were, not to haul you out, brother, but I am. <laughs> I put the questions back in the chat, by the way. Thank you, Marcus. And yeah, I was going to get this screen up again here where everyone can see what, what the main focus is. It says he Daniel can't unmute. So let me find him. Maybe I can get him to do so. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, so one of the main topics, uh, I'm in the world of regional districts. Um, you know, where like everywhere, resources and uh, funding and all those fun things and are limited. But the one thing what we were talking about is really regional districts. Um, up this way are normally uh, don't initiate such proposals. We can champion them when they do come to us and we may already have existing policies and documents to support it, but we are really not the initiator of said proposals. Um, and that's kind of one of the pieces that we talked about in our group here. In addition to that one also, and as Ashley and uh, Daniel had mentioned is like planners are typically on top of things. They are, you know, especially when it comes to knowing where their community's at and their desires, um, their interests, where the trends are, all right? Um, but without uh, groups, and, and as a result, sometimes the plans are out of date. And really it's the approaching of these groups with interests or these 
uh, with these initiatives that would then trigger planners to then go, oh yeah, hey, let's update this to allow for that. Or let's go through that process to update uh, because that is an interest. And they may have that interest, right? As planners, we're people too. Um, and, and they welcome that because it's like, yes, now we can put some resources and time to it, right? So it's it, 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 so really it's to encourage the community to approach and have that conversation. Yeah, thank you, Christine. And there was something else added to the chat by Kenna. Um, Planner-led community engagement on reimagining school land use for the longer term planning, budgeting, and school programs deliveries. So I don't know if Kenna, if you want to speak to that more, if anyone else wants to um, add into that. Host needs to unmute her, hun. It's weird that setting, hey? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I've never worked with, with that setting before, so can I? Yeah, me neither, yeah. Uh, find you here and I'll no, I, I, I think we figured it out. Okay, great. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, our group discussed how school districts don't have planners on staff and if you had a planner on staff or if you had an intern or if somebody was interested in doing a thesis, uh, this is probably something that um, it would be really interesting. Large, you know, schools have a large tracts of land around them and a lot of it is underutilized by the school or the kids. And so it'd be really interesting to see what a community led process would look like on reimagining that school at from a community point of view versus just to deliver a school system program. Yes. And then if you were to able to actually compile that document um, with uh, you know, feedback and participation uh, and present it to the school district, it's really hard to say no to a, a large project that you see benefits in versus one school going to the school district and saying, hey, can we have a little bit of money because we want to do this? And it's easier to turn those one-offs down than when it's a larger project that's designed to, to forward or advance um, a delivery of, of, of teaching and learning. So, and the other big thing that we talked about is really about how um, a lot of people see long-term learning through schools, uh, so universities, colleges, um, whether that's academic or it's trades, um, agriculture should be in there. There should be agricultural schools and it's not just to learn about, um, you know, soils, soils is part of it, right? The science-based part, but it's really about how do you grow food? What's the best type of foods to grow? Um, what's the traditional growth in the region you want to live and work in? Those schools would be so valuable and it would give another pathway for people to explore opportunities for economic diversification and to support themselves. So that's, that's, sort of a summary of what our group was talking about. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Kenna. Um, yeah, that was, there's a lot, a lot, definitely so important in all of that. Um, and so much, so much opportunity in that as well. Um, so yeah, if anyone else wanted to contribute um, key points, or you're also welcome to um, to add those into the Google document and another and into the chat. Um, and then another area thing we wanted to bring up to talk about as well, which builds off of this, is um, like future sessions and topic ideas. Um, so from this, like, are you interested in more sessions with Farm to School BC or, or just, um, you know, more workshops and knowledge gathering and coming together around this topic? Um, so I have the same mentee link that you had um, last time. You're, you're welcome to go in there and same before if you want to enter into the chat. Uh, and into the Google document, um, maybe way, ways we can share. And I'm just gonna go shot, stop my screen share here and go to the Menti link to see uh, what people are contributing there. But then, yeah, we can just open up the discussion as well to uh, discuss thoughts on future sessions or ways that we can uh, come together. 
Well, another point that my group brought to the fore that I thought, think is quite a, a valuable one is that uh, we need to stop building buildings for single use. So why are schools sitting fallow in the summer and in, on the weekends? Uh, it should be tucked in. And the one thing in the research that UMBC did, uh, Dr. Teresa uh, Healy and Dr. Eddie Booth and myself was there's a there's a real lack of hubs. And I know you know this, Rowan, because of the work that you do. Uh, but why can't our buildings, so community centers, schools have commercial kitchens? Because now you can't sell your, you, a lot of farmers that used to make things and bring to sale can't because they don't have a commercial kitchen or a food safe kitchen. So why can't we, I, I, we need to move away from these single use developments. Uh, and of course you can do it by design, right? Keeping the kids that come out on this end, this side's the community use, right? Because people are always like for the safety of the kids. And then maybe even have an Ellers area. Um, but the idea of having a knowledge center, um, a teaching area, a preparing, it's all within that one center that the kids then get fed from, right, in terms of the cafeteria and farm to school. Um, and also what it does is it decreases vandalism because there's more people around. It increases the food champions having access to other people who can then help out because capacity and volunteers are a big issue. And my big one is it uses my tax dollars far more efficiently. That was Daniel's. Uh, my taxpayer one was mine. Yeah, thank you very much, Christine, for all of that. Does anyone else want to um, to jump in and speak to this? Uh, these are interesting points here in case studies on what's working and what's not. So how maybe how can we... Um, work together in that and how to get planners and teachers in one room. That's some, somewhere we can actually definitely um, work to support that happening. Um, and I see Nicole, you have um, your hand up there. Yeah, um, thank you. I'm joining from the city of Penticton. So a little bit uh, south of the Northern area, but it was where I spent most of my childhood growing up and attended university in Prince George at UMBC. Um, so I'm kind of thinking, I mean, I'm in Penticton, we're not a huge municipality, but we do have a few planners in our department. And from what I recall up north, there's a few planners maybe in a department. So um, it's just kind of wondering where does this sit? Does it sit on someone's desk? And does it, it always seems to be off of the side of our desk. We're very heavy with development and we don't actually have an agricultural planner. So who, like, is there, should there be a community champion at our city level? Is it a city staff member? Is it a planner? Um, we have a parks department as well that I would say is more familiar with vegetation and soil types than I would have been based on my education. And so how is there a way that at the city we can try to get some more knowledge for us to be able to kind of push it out? Because we have talked about how planners are not always in the same room as as the schools, but do we have do we have that knowledge to be able to help them as well to get where they need to go if we do ever get in the same room as as them, if that makes sense. So we don't have an agricultural planner in Penticton. I'm guessing not very many places up north have them either. And how do we try to try to kind of get that knowledge and how we can push it? out as well when when we do get these opportunities which I don't think we get enough of them unfortunately because we don't have very many new schools going in where I am so it would be fun to plan a new school and really try to push them to do some of this stuff but um, if I can one of the other things that we chatted about in in my breakout room was um, David Connell had brought up um, how teachers have a lot of flexibility with what they can teach through their curriculum and how agriculture is, um, we discussed maybe has not become part of the requirement yet for the school district. And teachers have an immense amount of flexibility to what they can do. So I think in, in our area anyways, I've noticed there's a lot of young and excited teachers that are grabbing onto these things and really excited with them. But um, another member in the group mentioned your budget um, is is often limited and having to you know learn how to how to do this how to teach people how to do this in your classroom and then getting budget for how to how to actually build these things out and and make them happen um, and I, I'm not sure if if that was to happen that a teacher would come 
to the city and ask for a planner to to maybe help them as well. So a lot of different thoughts spinning around in my brain for you. So there's my brain dump of everything. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that contribution. I think I captured most of that in the notes there. Thank you. So uh, seeing that it's uh, 124, um, I'm just going to share my screen one more time here and then we can work to um, wrap up because yeah, it'd be lovely to um, facilitate um, connections and more opportunities for us to um, connect together within this and see how, yeah, to, to close some of those gaps. And oops, there we go. So thank you everybody for contributing and discussing and taking notes that, that we can use to take, um, to take with us from this um, group meeting together and for Christine for supporting us in coming and uh, meeting with you today and having the opportunity per to present because yeah, there's a lot of opportunity here and then moving forward with the advancements of food literacy with at every level. I think in integrations and collaborations within um, with planners and at the, the different levels is so much opportunity there. So thank you so much for that. And I just wanted to, um, as we're saying our goodbyes, just pass this over to Marcus to speak to an upcoming opportunity that we have. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks uh, all for the lively discussion and breakouts, et cetera. Yeah, just wanted to let you all know that um, we're hosting a, a large conference, um, large for us, I guess, uh, about 300 people. Um, that is going to be at UBC Nest in Vancouver. And so it's going to be all things uh, connected to uh, food literacy, school food, uh, farming, uh, you know, the stuff we've talked about essentially at this. So we expect to have um, representation from nonprofits, academia, teachers, school districts, uh, community partners, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So right now our call for proposals is open. If there's anyone here who has you know, a special interest in this kind of work uh, and would like to uh, present, please uh, do put in an abstract. And if you're just interested in coming and checking out what it's all about, making connections, then uh, yeah, our uh, registration uh, early bird is open right now and will be on for a while. And it's uh, May 17th to 19th is, is the actual conference. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks team. I really appreciate it. Thanks everybody for attending. And also check out March 15th's webinar, uh, where we're going to have three stellar presenters uh, to build on uh, webinar one and two. Um, and I guess just really quick, um, Rowan, do you mind folks following up with you directly if they have any questions or comments or ideas? No, not at all. That's actually, um, yeah, why well, here uh, sharing this awesome. screen here. Thank you. Um, definitely um, reach out to myself or Marcus uh, directly to follow up with anything here. We'd love to hear from you. And I also shared in the link earlier on, but the link to our website, but farmschoolbc.ca, where you can also gain all of our contact information there and uh, explore more and link to the conference as well if you have any questions there. And um, yeah, Marcus is is the person to go to about the conference if there's a lot of interest, but I can also support um, there as well. And yeah, if you have any- Awesome. Just thinking if everybody has any seeds of thought to just follow up through in and say, hey, we were thinking about this. I'm wondering if you know, and then there it goes. Yeah, and thanks again, folks. That was awesome. And thank yeah, you to present thanks. to the participants for your interest. Yeah, and I'll just say one nice. last thing of the Google document link I shared, that'll stay open too. So if you have brainwaves awesome. at two in the morning and you want to add things in. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thanks all. Thank you.